that's what Jesus Christ did. He looked into the world. He saw us. He saw us dying. He saw us flailing. And he loved us so much that he wrote himself in. And he became a human being, though he was God, and he saved us. Emmanuel, God with us. That's what it means. Right. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. Good to be with you guys. Uh, we are glad that you guys are here with us on this uh, merry early week before Christmas. Uh, glad that you guys are, are here. Um, if you are visiting today, my name is uh, Kirk. I'm one of, the, one of the pastors here. And uh, I have the joy of sharing God's word with uh, you all today. Intentionally using the word joy as we get to look into this uh, Advent day of joy. And we're going to look at what's called uh, blessed joy. And so if you have a Bible, we will be in the book of Habakkuk. I'm sure you guys are already planned to be in Habakkuk today. I get that. So uh, it, Habakkuk is an Old Testament minor prophet. So if you get a chance, go ahead and head there now. And uh, before we jump in, I just want to pray for us. And then we'll, we'll get rolling a little bit here. Um, to join me. God, thank you for... Uh, just the truth of your word. God, I pray that uh, your word today would just uh, speak to uh, our hearts, God. Would you bring an encouragement, Lord, uh, in, in moments where, Lord, seasons can be, uh, feel challenging for, uh, for many, Lord, and dealing with struggles and, and hurts and pains and uh, sorrows. God, would you bring uh, a, a joy that's everlasting, Lord? Would you bring a joy that uh, is just uh, constant and true? And uh, we thank you that we have joy uh, through uh, your word and through what Christ has done. And so we just give this time to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so we are going to be in Habakkuk, and we're going to look at chapter 3 today in that book, if you've got a chance to uh, take a look. And if you need a Bible, we'd love to get you one. We have a bunch of Bibles out front there. Just let us know. We'd love to get you a Bible you can put it in your hand, or you can use the old Bible app. Uh, that's super helpful as well. Um, and so the reason we're going to be in Habakkuk is I, I think in this minor prophet study, I think we get a really good offering of what it means to, to walk with a blessed joy. Uh, we get this offering of joy that is from this experience that um, this, this man Habakkuk is, is going through. And, and I think it's important to have a biblical perspective of joy. Joy, this, this, this emotion, this um, experience, this feeling. And as we look real quick, as we look to Habakkuk, I just want to be clear that we're, um, Habakkuk, I wouldn't say is like a, a hero that we're looking to in any way. Uh, he's a good guy, but we only see a, a, just kind of a, a snippet of his life. But we're looking to Habakkuk just to see kind of um, where, the way he, he approaches things, not, not look, lifting him up, right? The, the, the point of the heroes of the Bible is it's Jesus is the hero, ultimate hero. We believe that to be true. But we do uh, glean things from different uh, people in the Bible. And Habakkuk is one of those where we can glean a little bit of what it looks like to find some blessed joy. So I'm going to give you guys just a biblical perspective today, an offering of blessed joy. And the reason I think it's important to have a biblical perspective and biblical offering is we are finding ourselves right now in a season, holiday season, where joy is something that I think is, is an expectation right? that a lot of people are kind of seeking in, in our lives. There tends to be around the holidays this like uptick in this desire for joy, this call for joy, this, this presentation of, of joy. Like we, for instance, we sing carols that say joy to the world, right? Joy, rejoice, all these things, joy. And it's not um, the, the one about the, the bullfrog named Jeremiah. We're talking about the one about Jesus coming. That's an old, old reference. Some of you guys get that. Thanks. That's awesome. But nonetheless, whether we're talking about these things, there, there's this anticipation of joy. And we also have joy from, you know, people saying that we're going to get presents from, from, from a big guy on a sleigh, right? And we, we call that guy uh, jolly, and we call that guy jovial. Like, there's this joy that comes culturally as we sit in this time of year. It kind of presents an expectation for and of joy. And I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, right? I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. But here's the thing. I, I do think there's a little bit of a... A challenge as we have this expectation of what I'm going to call seasonal joy, I think it, it contains some flaws. 
I, I think it, it, there's, there's challenges to it. For, for example, for those who maybe be dealing with, who might be dealing with circumstances that, I don't know, might make it hard to find joy or to act joyful. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe this year you're dealing with, with loss, like loss of a, um, just a, a loved one, someone, someone close in, in your lives. Like, what do we, what do, we do with, with, with that, right? If we just have a, pre, a seasonal, like, presentation of joy. Right? How, how do we navigate that? I know, I know for, for me, um, my, my mom passed three, three years ago, and, and so when the holidays come around, it's not, it, it's hard to just be like, oh, the holidays are here. Here's my, my joy. Here's the expectation. Especially if, if, if I'm just not, I'm feeling more sorrow or just loss, and it's not feeling joyous. And the holidays kind of went from joy to now moments of, of pain. What, what about like those who are experiencing the effects of, uh, of an economy that's just kind of, who knows, or in, in, in um, inflation, or just maybe the potential loss of a, of a job, financial hardships. Like, what, where do we find seasonal joy in that? Or, or maybe just a breakup, or family struggles, or family betrayal. What about, what about even like crisis of faith? And so I think the, the offer of, of, of seasonal joy, I would actually even argue, if this is a universal offer, it feels a little bit unkind. It feels a little bit just, just unfair. Like, if, if the offer for joy in the midst of this, this like, uh, just challenging processing loss is, well, here, cheer up, like, Santa's got a gift for you. Like that, or there's no place like home for the holidays. Hang in there, right? I, I, I got to be honest, I, that, that feels very dismissive of our circumstances. And so what do we do with this presentation of this seasonal joy. Uh, one option is we could get um, bitter. We could turn to like the, the Christmas curmudgeon and like, you know what, we can get all Scrooge and just say kind of like bah humbug to everything, say crappy Christmas and do all the crap night. We could do that, right? Um, but I don't, I don't know if that's the answer. Or we could go the opposite. We could put on our like merry masks. We could pretend that everything's joyful, everything's Great, trying to hold back tears, though, at the same time from different struggles and, and burdens. Like, yes, great tidings, my friends. Good, great joy, right? So, so those are the season, those are the challenges. Like, we can go Christmas curmudgeon, or we could go to this kind of merry masks. And that's why I think having a, a, a third option is really, really important. And that's what I love about God's word, is we get this, this, this offering that is a, a, a better offering than having to live in some sort of just bitterness or even have to live in some sort of denial if we are going through things that are really hard in a season that's expecting us to, to find joy. And so here's what I want us to look at as we look at the book of Habakkuk. I, I think we can actually find joy even when things are just feel like they're falling apart and things just feel bleak. I think we can actually find a blessed joy and here's the simplest kind of takeaway truth that we're going to see from the text today. So you can just, just write this down. It's, it's, it's this. It's just blessed joy is found when we embrace the character of God in the midst of our circumstances. All right, that's, that's what we're going to find through this, this, this whole passage of Habakkuk. It's this blessed joy is found when we embrace the character of God in the midst of our circumstances. And I want to highlight this word embrace not, not that it's like one of my favorite words or anything like that, but I want to highlight it because if you look at the, uh, the name Habakkuk, it actually translates to this word embrace. That's what it translates to. The Hebrew word that's used there is, is habak, and that means to fold one's hand, that means to embrace. And now there's been like a, a debate, a discussion between scholars and theologians on this idea of embracing in, in regards to Habakkuk. A lot, of, a lot of people wonder if, if the verb is like kind of played out in his role as he is the one who's embracing for God's people, or if Habakkuk himself is the one who's needing the embrace of God. For, for instance, Mar, Mar, Martin, Martin Luther, he takes this approach. He says that is, this is an active. He's embracing the people of God who are in turmoil. That's, that's where he falls. And then we have the church father, uh, Jerome, who sees Habakkuk as needing the embrace from God. So we have two kind of different like camps here. 
So here, here's where I've landed in my, you know, theological mind. Whether it's embraced or being the one who, who needs to embrace others. I, I personally, I think, I think he played both roles in this. I think he's part of both of those. And the reason I landed there is because I was thinking about our walk as followers and disciples of Jesus. Here, here, it's probably true that at times we may find ourselves navigating both of those roles of being the one who's embracing, who God's using to embrace, but also times of needing to be embraced by God. I, I know for, for many, including myself this year, uh, there was a lot of times that I realized I needed to be embraced by God. I had, I had back surgery this year. It was, it was not a great time, and I needed this embrace. And if I'm honest, I need God's embrace every day. But yet, there are other days where I found myself being used by God's, uh, God to embrace. And so I, I think like when it comes to this embrace, I, I think as Christ followers, we're gonna, we kind of get to walk in this beauty of, of both. To recognize the, the need for both in our lives. Now, I, I find this to be, if I'm honest, I find this to be pretty, pretty tough to, um, to feel like I'm, I'm, I need something or I'm needy. And, I, and that's probably because we're in a culture that really values self-sufficiency. That's, that's a cultural value. And because of that, it's kind of led us more to being the ones who we can offer helping others. We can offer embracing others. But we're, we're not really like needy people, right? We don't need things. We're from North Jersey, right? That's not what we need. We don't need uh, anything from others or like the divine. But here's what I want to challenge us as Christians. I, I think we need to battle that cultural pull. And we need to, to start to, to rest and embrace. To be okay with the reality that, that we're, we, we need. And really step away from the, the pride that can handle, hey, we can, I can handle all that's going on. I can handle everything. That, that danger, the pull, of like self-sufficiency, instead of what, what, what God offers is resting in his embrace or resting even in the embrace of the church family that he surrounded us with. Here's what it, it kind of reminds me of. Um, there's this cultural expectation, that I think, if, if you're a parent out there, that, that you might face where basically somehow, as a culture, we've come to the conclusion that two or maybe one parent can provide everything their kid will actually need, right? And then when we try to play that out, and, and how often so many parents kind of fall short, they feel like they're, they're failing, right? Because they, they can't somehow provide for every need of their kid. And, and like, of course that would be the case. Like, if we expect that we should be the ones as parents to provide everything, Right, to provide care, provide discipleship, provide wisdom, provide guidance, provide all these things, every need for our children. Like that's an unrealistic expectation. And that's actually not how God designed it. See, God's design, he designed it to be in community. It's to walk with others, to allow the embrace of walking with other spiritual mothers, other spiritual fathers in our lives through this whole journey of parenting. So I don't know if any parents out there feel like they're kind of like falling short in that way. Maybe before you make that determination, maybe just ask, like, have I embraced and allowed others to just embrace us in this process? All right, so, so back to Habakkuk, which is a cool band name, which I'm gonna, eventually I'm going to take. But we're, this is what we're going to do. We're going to focus more on um, just the, the being blessed, this blessed joy by what Habakkuk does by embracing the character of God. And we're going to look at different uh, characteristics of, of God in this process. And so before we dive in, though, I think it's important to look at the circumstances that Habakkuk finds himself in. And in this, this kind of push towards something that ex just the seasonal joy is not going to be able to, to take care of. Because right now in Habakkuk's life, as we see him in this, his circumstances are really, really tough. They're tough. So, so what is he up against? Well, the circumstances Habakkuk is navigating, and it's requiring him to, to, to really seek a joy outside of his, his just experience right there. And the first thing he's encountering, and I know this, this might be really hard for us to, to really relate to, okay? So I'm just going to put it out there. So Habakkuk, he's, he's going through two things right now, two major issues. The first one is this. It's an international crisis. And the second one 
It's uh, national corruption and political unrest, okay? So hopefully, like in 2023, we can actually somehow relate to those two bucket items, right? And obviously, I'm being sarcastic. You guys hopefully know that. But what's important to point out is that, you know, what we're dealing with in this world right now, at times we can feel like this is just like uncharted territory. How, I can't believe, that's not necessarily the case, there, this international crisis, national corruption, it's, it's, it's really nothing new to the world and the history of this world. Now, right now, we might be identifying it as maybe international crisis could be, we think of Ukraine, we think of, of Israel, we think of, of, of Gaza. And for Habakkuk, what he was dealing with this time was the superpower of, of Babylon. So what's happening is Babylon is becoming this world power. Babylon has rebelled against Assyria, and from there, Babylon's actually gone on to overthrow the once powerhouse known as, as Egypt. And so what stands next in the way is Judah. It's this kingdom of Judah, and to take its inhabitants captive, and that's where Habakkuk finds himself. And so this new crisis is, is on the move. He's this uncertain force, and this uncertain power is overtaking the, the world that Habakkuk is living in. And that doesn't really sound joyful. And it also, I, you know, it, it sounds relatable to where we might find ourselves in our time right now. Right? Where, where international crisis is, is taking place. And as this international crisis is taking place, uh, it's taking the world stage, well, here's what's happening at home. National corruption of that time, it's actually being put on display. So during this time, we see this, this disunity, this division taking place in the kingdom of Judah. And here's how it's happened. So King Josiah was a really good king, one of the, one of the good ones, I guess we call him. His reign was actually coming to an end. And Josiah's son... I might butcher the name, but Jehoahaz, he takes his place, and he was also good, right? He was, he was a, good, a good king. But then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have this guy named Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz all right? Two different guys. Um, sorry, Jehoiakim, sorry, Jehoiakim. He overthrows Jehoahaz. Super confusing, we'll get there. But, and Jehoiakim was actually put in place by this Egyptian government, okay? Who was actually, he was kind of this, like, puppet, and so Jehoiakim, he, he brings evil to the land. He was known as, as ungodly. And so the next thing you know, you have a nation that has corruption in the office itself. You have disdain even for those who oppose the, the office. You have this kingdom that's divided and it's stained with deception. So international crisis, political unrest. What, what do we think? Familiar to us? Is it relatable to us at all? Of course it is, right? God's word is evergreen. It's evergreen. It's timeless. As we see history repeat itself over and over again, there's nothing new. They talk about Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. And, and so these circumstances, they, they, they seem to be relatable to us. And so if that's the case, how do we find, how do we find this blessed joy in the midst of our crisis? Well, here, here's the first step. Here's the first way we do it. Which we embrace the omnipresence of God. The omnipresence of God. Right? Because we see all these powers that come and go, right? All these different political things happening, and these struggles, but yet throughout that, what, who remains? Well, it's the same God who was and always will be is present. Right? And, and, and not only is this character one that is present, Right? He's always constant, always there. He, he actually even one-ups one that. He goes with omnipresent. So to be more precise in what that means is that he's never absent. He's never absent. He is present in all situations. He's present in all circumstances. He is a constant in a world that's filled with all these, I would say, changing circumstances. And so this blessed joy, here's what it calls us to do. It calls us to embrace this uh, blessed uh, reality of, of omnipresence, of omnipresence of God, which is such this incredible attribute. And, and so I love how the book of Habakkuk tells us that God's amazing character is that being of omnipresent. And I love how, how it goes about doing it. I'm going to tell you how, how it looks. See, this, this book allows us to see this glimpse 
of this interaction with this prophet and his God. And now the interaction isn't one that's kind of like, um, you know, just, he, he, he's, he's being super honest and super raw. The prophet, he's not holding back. Right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's different from um, maybe there's like a, a, the example of, it's the opposite of like the workplace chatter, right? If um, at work you're just kind of the boss isn't anywhere and then people are just all like, oh, this place stinks, blah, 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 right? I can't, can't wait to get out of here. And then all of a sudden, right, the boss shows up and everything changes, right? Everything's like, oh, really, thank you for my, my work here, my position here, right, to the boss. And so this is the opposite. The whole vibe changes. But Habakkuk, he shows that God's omnipresent. He doesn't withhold. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't pretend that like God is absent he doesn't pretend God's not there we see this this prophet he's wrestling with God through the confusion through the uncertainty of time he 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 wrestles and I love that as the reader we get to uh, this access to this honest dialogue we get to see this kind of play out which then points us to another aspect of embracing blessed joy which is to embrace honesty Embrace this honesty of who God is and embrace the honesty of our relationship with him. See, God is so secure and he's so powerful in who he is that he's totally fine even with us listening in today with this interaction with Habakkuk. This book shows we don't need to like wait outside while the grown-ups talk about the grown-up things. That's not what we see. God is saying, here you go. Here's front row seats to my prophet who's trying to come to terms with things that he's having trouble understanding. And so here's what God, he allows us to know, which, which I think, I think it brings such joy. He allows us to know through our, our moments of honesty that he's present, that he cares, that we can be honest with our feelings because he's God, he can handle our inquiries. He can handle our confusion. He can even handle our times of, of anger. Like, I, I, I love that about our God. And we see this in the Psalms, too. We see the Psalms are so filled with these examples where he welcomes honesty. Because he's, he's present. He's there in the moment. Like, he's not on, he's not on like, break. He's not, like, being too busy interacting with, like, the executives. Like, he's there. And so the question that maybe we get to, to wrestle with this morning is, like, do, do we feel like we can be honest with God? Like, do we feel like we can talk to him like a, like a father? Because that's what he says he is. Can we find joy knowing that we have a God who actually wants to hear from you and that he allows us to be honest? Maybe, maybe some of us find that challenging. Maybe that's, that's not so easy. Maybe your experience with a father has been one that maybe the father's been like dismissive or like just self-absorbed. And so here's the joyful truth. That's not the character of God, right? He actually wants to hear from you. Even if, even if you're disappointed with your circumstances, your situation, Habakkuk is very disappointed in this whole thing, right? He's present, He's, he's near. He allows us to be honest. And of course, as we're honest with him, what's also important to remember is that we also need to be honest about who he is. Right? Because at the same time, God welcomes our honesty. He's also the God of all creation who should be revered. He should, he deserves our awe. He deserves our worship. But what I love about Habakkuk because I believe this book, it displays that balance well. It displays it well. So if you're not familiar with this book, here's what I would just encourage you to do. Um, give it a read this week. It's three chapters. It's, it's, it's incredibly insightful. But here's just a real, real, real brief overview of the first two chapters leading up to where we're being in chapter three today. So the, the book, it begins with this complaint. Uh, Habakkuk's dialogue begins with, hey, God, what is going on here? Like, why is this happening? And what, what does God do? He responds from a place of authority, but also from love. And then chapter 2, Habakkuk gives another complaint. He goes back to the complaining. And, and he does what? He says, he, God answers. And God reminds Habakkuk of one incredible thing, of God's unchangeable character. He doesn't remind Habakkuk of his circumstance, but he reminds him of his unchangeable character. He reminds him that he's the God over his circumstance. 
And so this, this, this book is so beautiful. As we see Habakkuk begin this, he, he has this, like an interrogation of God. And then only that to see God's character ends with like an intercession and a praise to God. And he prays and rejoices in who God is. And so chapter 3 is a prayer. Chapter 3 is this, it's a song actually. It's almost like in the psalmist pattern. And he sings this prayer to God as he responds to bringing his concern to God and giving him just this, and God revealing an answer of who God is. And from that, Habakkuk, he's filled with joy. What's happened is Habakkuk's wrestling with God over the, the world surrounding him that, that results in a joy. It's a blessed joy. It's a joyful praise. So here's what, here's what it says, chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. Lord, I have heard the report of you in your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make it known, your wrath, remember mercy. So here, here's what Habakkuk, he's, he's recognizing, he's stating. He's saying, God, I, I, I've heard of your fame. And in that, what is, what is he declaring? He's like, God, I know who you are. And, and in that, he's displaying this, this next principle. It's to embrace sovereignty. Embrace God's sovereignty. Because here's the reality. We all come to the place where we recognize that there, there is truly a God, right? If we're, if we're all human, right, which I, unless there's AI amongst us today, I think that's all of us, we, we are made aware of who God is. Paul actually talks about us in Romans. He says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made. So we, we get to know that there is a God because we look at the creation around us. It's hard to deny that. And so whether we believe in God or not, like well, here's the thing, he, he believes in you and he's revealed himself through his creation. So that we might know that he's real. We might know that he's powerful. We might know, like Habakkuk knows, we might know his fame. And so I, I, I love this verse because here's what Habakkuk stating. He said, God, it is so alarming how often that I become overwhelmed by my circumstances and I lose sight of who you are. I lose sight of your character. I lose sight that you are actually in control, that you are sovereign over my circumstances, over all these things. Habakkuk is saying, God, I, I lost sight of your might. And I, I find that so convicting. I am um, just forgetting at times God's sovereignty and his reign and rule over all things. And I was reminded this week of the struggle uh, that I, I remembering God's character during the, the good old um, lockdown time back in 2020. I remember um, having what I'd say bouts of like spiritual amnesia. And one moment in particular was um, I was struck with the thought of like, how is everything going to go back to normal? Like, how, like is that even going to be possible? And, and I couldn't figure it out. Like, I just like was stuck there. I kind of fell into like a, a, like a panic. And I remember just having the opportunity to share that. There was a group of guys we met, uh, morning Zoom discipleship group. That was a, a wonderful time back in the day. But I remember sharing that with these guys and saying, one of the guys saying, you don't need to figure it out. It's not your job. You're not sovereign over all things. God is. Find joy in that. He said, your role is to be reminded of the character of the one who was not only was faithful, but he is faithful and will continue to be faithful to come. And I remember just kind of reflecting on the joy that came with knowing God's character of faithfulness. And now, of course, like 2024, we can kind of, for the most part, the world is, seems to be back to the way it was. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But I, I think that I was just so thankful for the, the joy that came from like these faithfulness reminders. Faithfulness reminders of who God is, that he's faithful. And so the next thing we need to embrace is this. It's embrace immutability, all right? Immutability is a word we don't use too often, but here's what it means. It's that God never changes. That's what it means to be immutable. And so he was faithful. His faithfulness doesn't change. And I think we need to continue to have these faithfulness reminders. Right? I know as, human, as a human, right, we need these daily. 
And maybe whatever season you're in, maybe a struggling season, maybe things are unknown, uncertain in your life, like the question might be, do you have reminders of God's faithfulness in your life? Do you have those reminders? Moments of like reflection that just remind you of how good, how faithful God is and has been and always will be. Maybe for some it's just the moment of our salvation. Or maybe it's just the moment where we met Jesus. Maybe for others it's the moment where he brought you out of an affliction. He brought you out of an addiction. But, but what is it? Like what is it that you can turn to? That you can uh, just remember to, to know God's faithfulness. This week I uh, ordered myself a uh, gratitude journal for the new year. And um, I, I'm going to rename it a faithfulness folder, which is so corny. And, but I'm going to do it. But the reason is I know how easy it is to forget God's character in the midst of our hard circumstances. And so for the Christian, what I want to remind us of is we have a few universal Reminders of, of God, these God's faithfulness reminders. And, and, and it's this first one is, is this blessed joy through the incarnation, right? That's, that's what we're celebrating here as we look at this Advent. It's this Emmanuel, it's God with us. So that's, a, that's a faithfulness reminder that God sent his son Jesus. And also a great faithfulness reminder is God's rescue, right? Through the work of Jesus on the cross. We can see the cross and we can remember the cross. Right? As Romans said, God showed his love, his faithfulness, that while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. So the next thing we need to embrace is embrace this rescue. And as we think about our circumstances that we've experienced and encounter in our lives, here's what I need to ask if you're a follower of Jesus. Do we include God's plan of rescue right? as one of our circumstances? Do we include the cross, the resurrection, as part of our circumstances? Sometimes we need those reminders of God's faithfulness in those past circumstances. And so the question is, well, do those circumstances make the cut? Right? Do those make the cut? Like, and listen, I wasn't present for the event. I wasn't there for the, the crucifixion, for the resurrection. I wasn't there. But that circumstance changed my life. It's kind of like none of us were at the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, but yet there's the impact from that past circumstance. And those moments, can we allow them to serve as foundation, as how we embrace joy in whatever circumstance we may come to see happen, right? Embracing God's circumstances that's rescued us as we engage these circumstances that we currently face. And so Habakkuk, he looks to the past faithfulness of God, and he praises God for what's to come. Here's what it says next. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah, that means pause. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of praise. His brightness with the light, rays flashed from his hand. There he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His, his were the everlasting ways. I saw the tent of cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. And so as Habakkuk recalls the ways of God, he's actually reminded to embrace joy as he encounters and remembers to embrace incarnation. It means God being with us. So we actually have the joy of looking at this book of Habakkuk from uh, the vantage point that's very different than where Habakkuk is coming from. Of, of God entering in. We get to look at it from the reality of the incarnation of Jesus. But Habakkuk, he's looking at this just awaiting the Messiah. Just awaiting that Jesus is going to God's promise. And so we get to see it a little bit differently from the lens of Jesus' entering his death, his resurrection. We have an advantage to this promise of entering into these, looking back so we can enter in our circumstances to find joy. And we even have evidence and we get to live in light of this evidence of Jesus actually existing, Jesus actually rising from the dead. We get to see that throughout. And so that can give us evidence of God's faithfulness as we look to this moments that we may find ourselves in that feel challenging. And we also have the Spirit of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, the evidence of the Spirit of God breathing, pointing us to Jesus in all of our circumstances. And Habakkuk He's actually just looking at this promise, but he can trust God's promise. 
He can trust that God is faithful. He's reminded of God's presence throughout. And he finds this blessed joy because he actually looks, he looks to God's word. He looks to the reality of God's word. He says, your word declares to be true. And so the next thing we see is embrace the word. I love this because Habakkuk, he reflects in his prayer. He goes to the words of Moses. He goes to the words of scripture. He goes to God's word for truth. Like he steps away from whatever he's feeling in that moment and he seeks a real source of truth. Look what, he, look what Moses writes because Habakkuk puts this in his prayer. Moses writes this in Deuteronomy 33 too. He says, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hands. So Habakkuk, he's actually reflecting on the Pentateuch. It's the scripture of the time. And, and I I just love this because nothing has changed in where we can find truth. In our times of uncertainty, in our times of fear, unknown, we can take that same approach as Habakkuk. We can know that God is present because his word, it declares itself. Think about the way that John opens his gospel. He says, the the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Jesus arrived and appeared and he ushers in this new covenant built on his righteousness through this forgiveness of sins, through the gifting of the Spirit of God. And so we have the Word. And so do do we trust that the Word declares truth, that the Word allows us to find joy in the midst of our circumstances? Right As we're entering into maybe a challenging season, do we find ourselves clinging to the Word of God? And and listen, that that doesn't mean... um, you have to love reading to do so. I'll, I'll be honest, for a long time, I didn't enjoy reading. I wasn't a big reader. I am now, but um, I'm not saying that's the only platform, right? You don't have to be a reader. Be a listener of God's word, right? Be, be, hit up the Bible app. Have someone read it for you. Uh, I, I, it, that's, that's not being lazy. There's nothing like that. I, it's, it's, there's no shame in that. It's just a different learning style. The hope is that we get to just hear God's word, we get to read God's word, that we use God's word to remind us that we can have joy in our circumstance. And so as as we uh, close out this new, this this year, and come to almost to a new year, right, here's a good challenge for us. Are we, are we just desiring a greater depth and desire of the word of God? Like as a church, as a community, right? Something we can go after in 2024. But here's his prayer. It goes on. It says this. When, was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you in rift. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hand on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flesh of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced his own arrows, the head of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if I devoured the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. So what we see here now is this prayer now turns to this action. This action of finding joy, knowing that God is an active God. He's not just this passive, uninterested, apathetic God. And so the next thing we need to do is we need to embrace God's might, embrace the might. And in Habakkuk, he points out God's power in, in two different ways. The first is power over creation. Verses 8 through 11, I love the the personification and the glorification we see here. It says, God, when you act, the mountains, they see you and they just crumble. They're like, nope, no, 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 thank you, right? We're out of here. It says, the sun and the moon, they stand still. They're just like frozen, like the the presence of God is heading our way. Like this is not our time to shine at all, right? So so just, just take a moment and think about like the imagery here of God, like let that, let that sink in. Let, let that like permeate our, our personhood. That's who is in control of whatever circumstances you are encountering today. That same God who has the power over creation. That's the God who is in control of whatever you might face tomorrow. And the God who's always been in control of even everything prior. 
This is the God of power. And not only does he possess the power over the created earth, but he also, he also has sovereign reign over those who inhabit it. It says you march through the earth with a fury. It says he's unstoppable. You, you thresh the nation with anger. He says he is justice. And here's what happened. When Jesus arrives, he incarnates and he takes action. Like we saw in the Beatitudes series, he comes proclaiming the kingdom of God. It's this kingdom that cannot be shaken, which God offers us access through, through, through Christ's work, through King Jesus. It's this kingdom that we will see well, one day there will be this great feast and the bride, the church, will, will not be stopped. The gates of hell will not prevail, nor any sort of created nation. No nation. All the nations will one day bow down and they will give Jesus praise. He's the God over all those things. Here's the last part. It closes out. It says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bone. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree shall not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the oil fall, fields yield no fruit. The flock be cut off from the fold, there will be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes, me feet, makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. So, so here's the last thing that we need to look at is just embracing salvation. See, joy is found there. That's, that's, that's the ultimate blessed joy. Here's the reality that, that Habakkuk is looking at. His circumstance, it's, it's not favorable. It doesn't look favorable. He doesn't, he doesn't look to a season to be able to fix him right now and bring him joy. But, but once again, Habakkuk, he understands Blessed joy, it's found when we actually embrace the character of God over our circumstances. And Habakkuk is rejoicing in the Lord in spite of any improvement of his circumstance. He says the fig tree might not produce food this year. He says the, the fruit, it might not sprout from the vines. He says there might not be any olives and the fields may be barren. And look, the herds, they might be scattered. Basically he's saying I may not eat, but guess what? I will rejoice. I will take joy in salvation. With God's strength, my movement of joy in tough circumstances will even be like that of like a prancing deer. And how does he get there? He only gets there because he, he has this realization that joy does not depend on outward prosperity. Joy is found in a person. That person is, is, is Jesus. And why do we say that it's Jesus? Well, because Jesus is the only one who offers us this gift of salvation. It's only through the gospel that we actually have blessed joy in this life and we are promised joy everlasting, joy to come. This blessed joy takes place when we receive Jesus' work on our behalf, forgiveness of our sins. And this work to come, it's this reality that we have joy everlasting as we get to worship this God, be in his presence for all of eternity. And so listen, as we close out 2023 and we have 2024 on the way, like we have, truth is we don't, we don't know what awaits. We have no idea. But I do think as followers of Jesus, we can look to this prayer and we can reflect, we can take solace in the character of the God, the one who's in control over all that might head our way. Why don't we uh, take some time, reflect on that, and, and I'll pray, and we'll uh, have the man come up and worship. Father, thank you that you, uh, you give us your word to declare truth. Thank you that we don't have to just speculate or just look and keep searching, searching and searching, Lord, only to come up short because, God, you, you have been so kind to allow us to know who you are, the God over our circumstance, Lord. Lord, I, I, I want to pray right now for anyone who's just going through really, really hard moments, Lord. Um, God, in, in no way are, are we looking to be dismissive of, of the challenges that come, Lord. And yet, at the same sense, Lord, I pray that 
the idea of being of this blessed joy that you are over all circumstances, God, would bring this, this joy this morning into their hearts, God. Thank you that you love us enough, Lord, to uh, just allow us once again to walk with you, to be in relationship with you. Thank you that the gospel allows us to have this relationship or that we can be close to you through Christ's righteousness. And so, God, I pray this morning for maybe anyone who's never taken that step towards salvation, towards this, this eternal blessed joy. God, would you just, Lord, would you just t- take, Lord, the, the, allow them to take a step in that moment today, God, just to trust you, Lord, to turn from sin and turn to you as the, the only source of true life, as the only source of this blessed joy. And God, we, we praise you and we, we lift this up in your name, Jesus. Amen.